you're here. I hope you're experiencing blessings at this camp meeting. Hope you're enjoying the fellowship and uh, all the good material, the information we've been receiving and uh, instruction and hopefully uh, things that we will take home with us to make a difference in somebody else's life too. Uh, again today we have with us Dr. Richard Davidson and uh, we've introduced him before. I'm just going to invite him up and I'm going to invite you to uh, pray with me. Our Father in heaven, again we're asking that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Speak to us. Help us to hear what you want us to hear. Open our eyes and help us to see what you want us to see. And Lord, guide our thoughts, guide our actions, guide our words. We pray your blessing. We pray your blessing on Dr. Davidson. And uh, again, we ask all of this in the name of your dear son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dr. Davidson, come on up. Good afternoon. Well, this afternoon we're going to shift gears. This morning we were traveling through the lands of the Exodus, and now we're going to uh, shift to a, a different theme that's related closely to the experience of Minnesota. Minneapolis, 1888, righteousness by faith and all of that. And even though I am an Old Testament professor, I'm interested in those theological issues and want to try to get as deep as I can get into the gospel. And uh, so you will see that I will still be not moving away from the Old Testament, but I'll, I'll save that for after we get started a little bit here. You've recognized this quotation from Ellen White, uh, this one here. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. I like that quote. So she pinpoints uh, justification by faith as very much a part of the third angel's message. We go back to the first book of the Bible, way back to Job chapter 9 and verse 2, and we find this poignant question asked by Job, how can a mortal be just before God? And if you stop and think about that question, it's really this question of one standing before God. How we can be just before God is kind of the, the most crucial question we face as human beings. What else matters ultimately besides that? And it then becomes the foundation of all the other truths that build upon it. So in the process of this week, I will be sharing my own experience regarding justification by faith and my misunderstandings and my continual growth and seeking to understand. Uh, but this, this afternoon, I first of all would like to point out how important Ellen White sees this topic of justification by faith. She writes in uh, Manuscript 36, 1890, right after the 1888 conference here in Minneapolis, she says, the light given me of God places this important subject above any question in my mind. I've looked in vain for her to say that about any other topic, above any other question in my mind. There has been too little educating in clear lines upon this point. She says again, some of our brethren have expressed fears that we shall 
dwell too much upon the subject of justification by faith. But I hope and pray that none will be needlessly alarmed, for there is no danger in presenting this doctrine as it is set forth in the scriptures. So I hope you don't think you've heard about this subject too often. Ellen White is urging us to go back to the basics and make sure we have right what is our standing before God, not just theoretically, but experientially. But there's a danger that we are facing. And the danger, she writes, has been presented to me again and again of entertaining as a people false ideas of justification by faith. So there is a biblical way of thinking about it, and then there's some dangerous uh, pitfalls in the, in the ditches on either side. I have been shown for years that Satan would work in a special manner to confuse the mind on this point. So we're going to try to hopefully dispel the clouds of uncertainty and confusion about this topic as we dig deeply into what Scripture has to say. I love hearing the sound of a crying child. I remember when I was pastoring in Flagstaff, very first district was Buckeye, Arizona, where I was the pastor just still in my 20s, and the youngest, next youngest member was in their 60s. And there was no sound of the crying of any babies, just the grayed hang hairs of the elderly, uh, to which group I've now joined. But then it seemed like a long way off. And so what the, about the second, third Sabbath, the head elder had a, a, a grandchild that, had vis that was visiting there in Buckeye, and so I preached my heart out, you know, preached my heart out to those 20-some people that were there in the Buckeye congregation. And there was this crying baby that cried throughout my entire sermon. And not having had any children yet myself, I was a, probably a little annoyed. Yes, I think I was. Here, is, here are these great words that I was trying to share and this baby was taking away all, all the attention to the, to the message. What was happening? So the head elder came up and for the closing prayer, he simply said these words. Dear Jesus, thank you for the sound of a crying baby here in our church again. And then I was rebuked. And then... Ever since then, when I hear a crying baby, I think, praise God, that is the future of our church. Let's love them. All right. So the danger is presented me, presented to me again and again of entertaining as a people false ideas of justification by faith. I've been shown for years that Satan would work in a special manner to confuse the mind on this point. And she goes on to say, the point that has been urged upon my mind for years is the imputed righteousness of Christ. I have wondered that this matter was not made the subject of discourses in our churches throughout the land, when the matter has been kept so constantly urged upon me, and I have made it the subject of nearly every discourse and talk that I have given to the people. Do you think Ellen White felt justification by faith was important? She says this in so many ways. Well, there is a different divergence of view. And so just so that we might see what we're up against, here are some of the views on justification by faith that are alive in Adventism. And lest you think I'm pointing any fingers at anyone who may hold some views, I think I can safely say at some point in my life I've believed all five of these, trying to get what the right one is. And I'm hoping I will share with you what I think is the biblical view, but I think we all still need to keep growing and loving one another and giving slack to one another and uh, realizing that uh, we're all still on the path of trying to understand this. So I don't come as one who has the final answers. 
I come as this fellow searcher who has, who has experienced the truth of justification by faith. And Ellen White has another quote I didn't put in here where she warns against another error. She says, some try to define too minutely the theoretical distinctions between justification and sanctification and others. And she was very concerned. It's not so much the fine points of distinction as experiencing and having been justified by faith and receiving assurance of salvation. So I'm going to try to describe it the best as I know how, and uh, you may have different words. But here are, some, here are some divergent views. There are those who support the Protestant position on justification, legal justification based upon the forensic imputation of the righteousness of Christ. That's one view. Some reject the legal model as totally culturally conditioned and the, the legal aspects of Scripture as representing a, a more primitive form of understanding, and now we can grow beyond that to a moral influence kind of theory and no, no longer a legal view. That's, that's popular in some areas in the church. Some argue that justification is not just to declare righteous, but to make us righteous, that both involve justification. And some see justification as only forgiveness of past sins. When we come to Christ, he forgives our past, but now as we start moving, living the Christian life, then we move into sanctification, and uh, these I've heard some even preach that when we get to a certain stage in our Christian development, we will no longer need justification because we will be, through the power of Christ, perfectly obeying him and no need to have forgiveness for any of our sins. So justifications for the past and it will be a thing of the past as uh, you mature in Jesus. That's, that's one another view. And then you recognize this one. Others talk about universal justification worked out objectively on the cross in Christ. You could give names to all of these and we could critique each one of these. That's not my task. You, um, I believe you, you know whether you have a real $1 bill in your pocket by looking at lots of $1 bills rather than looking at all the counterfeits. So we're just going to spend our time looking at the beautiful message of Scripture, and then uh, I think some of these things will sort themselves out. Now, I've collected over the years 25 single-space pages of quotations from Ellen White on justification by faith. And we could uh, go through those quotations. Uh, that's one way to study justification by faith. I've tried to look at everything Ellen White has ever said about justification by faith. I may have missed a few, but I think I've caught pretty much everything. And we will quote some of those this week. But I believe that the doctrine of justification by faith should not be taught based upon Ellen White. Now, I fully believe in Ellen White's inspiration, but she continually tells us, read what I say, then go back and find it in Scripture, and then teach it from Scripture so you can teach it to those who don't believe in my gift. And she goes on other places saying, little heed is given to the Bible, so God's given a lesser light to lead to the greater light. And she goes on to say, if you'd studied the Bible as you could and should have, you wouldn't have needed my writings. I'm a pointer, a messenger, to point back to Scripture. So we, we believe this is the foundation of our teachings. And so if we can't show it from the Scriptures, then we haven't done our homework. So let's... We'll Let's go about that today. However, uh, most people do like to look at what historians and what uh, has been said in church history about justification by faith, and so we could do another approach. Uh, back, what was it, 1517? So 2017, I was invited to go back uh, to Flagstaff as King of the North again. 
where I pastored for six years and to give a series that led up to October 31, Reformation Day, when 500 years earlier, the 95 Theses was pounded on the Wittenberg door. And I had fun that. Joanne and I went there and we spent three days, four days, five days maybe giving presentations on justification by faith according to the Reformers and showing how Martin Luther had, had recovered the gospel from the rubbish of error of the, of the Catholic uh, distortions of the gospel. And so that's another thing we could do in these three days. I love what Calvin says about justification. He says the doctrine of justification is the main hinge upon which religion turns. He further explained, for unless you understand, first of all, what your position is before God and what the judgment which he passes upon you, you have no foundation on which your salvation can be laid or on which piety toward God can be reared. And of course, Martin Luther says even stronger language. If we lose the doctrine of justification, we lose simply everything. And again, the article of justification is the master and prince, the Lord, the ruler, the judge over all kinds of doctrines. It preserves and governs all church doctrine and raises up our conscience before God. Without this article, the world is utter death and darkness. He goes on to say, whoever falls from the doctrine of justification is ignorant of God and an idolater. For once this doctrine is undermined, nothing more remains but sheer error, hypocrisy, wickedness, and idolatry, regardless of how much sanctity that appears on the outside. No error is so insignificant, so clumsy, so outworn, as not to be supremely pleasing to human reason and to seduce us if we are without the knowledge and the contemplation of this article of justification. Do you think he believed it was important? And he came to that because of his tower experience, because he had moved from a view that robbed him of his assurance of salvation to the picture of the uh, justification doctrine that gave him courage and gave him hope and gave him uh, assurance of acceptance by God. Now, is, was Luther on the right track? Well, this it gives me hope because uh, Ellen White, I believe, is inspired, and though I'm not basing my doctrine upon her, I do find her very helpful in stating regarding Martin Luther's view. He was talking about Luther and his, as his message was spreading throughout Germany. She says it was about this time that Luther, reading the works of Jan Hus, John Hus, found that the great truth of justification by faith, which he himself was seeking to uphold and teach, had been held by the Bohemian reformer. Our dean at the seminary, Dr. Moskala, Yezhi Moskala, was born in Bohemia. And he grew up learning about his hero, Jan Hus, who was the reformer that as we see here in this quotation, that recaptured justification by faith even before Martin Luther understood it and brought this light before the world. And then here's my favorite quote from Ellen White on justification by faith in the Reformation. The great doctrine of justification by faith so clearly taught by Luther had almost been lost sight of this was by the time of Wesley. And the Romish principle of trusting to good works for salvation had taken its place. According to that statement, do you see that Ellen White felt that Luther understood justification by faith? I find that. Now, he didn't understand all the uh, things that went with that. He, he didn't get right the uh, question of predestination and uh, the, some of the ideas about law versus gospel, but when it came to understanding the foundation of our salvation, he got it. He nailed it. And Ellen White spends many pages describing Martin Luther's 
uh, search to understand and how to be right with God. So we could spend the whole three days searching into the reformer's view, but that's not what I want to do. We could talk about the debate between the Catholics and the Protestants during the Reformation times that led up to the Council of Trent and how they distinguished. There's a very clear distinction between the Catholic view and the Protestant view. They usually formulate it. Our Protestant uh, friends, our Protestant uh, fellow Christians, they formulate it this way. The Catholic view is faith plus works yields justification. The Protestants, the Protestant summary is faith yields justification plus works. And then I, I explain in another line, justification is by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. You get that? It's by faith alone, but faith is never alone. As soon as the empty hands of faith reach out to accept the gospel, the fruit begins to be shown, not as the basis of salvation, but as the evidence of salvation. So that's the reformers. But I want to go back to the Bible. We're going back. So where else to go to study justification by faith than the one who talks more about it than any other person in Scripture, right? Paul, go to Romans, go to Galatians, chapter after chapter after chapter devoted to justification by faith. And most studies, and I've tried uh, to read as much as possible on justification by faith, and those who are examining it in the Bible, they invariably go to Paul. Not wrong, but I'm not a Pauline scholar. And furthermore, where did Paul get his ideas? Under inspiration, that's right. But where did the Spirit lead Paul in order to defend the view on justification? To his scriptures. What were the scriptures in Paul's day? The Old Testament. Paul builds his doctrine of justification by quoting Old Testament passages. And let me just read Romans 3 to see a summary of this. Verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law, Torah, and the prophets, the Old Testament. And then he proceeds to quote all over the place in the Old Testament to show what is done, righteousness by faith. So maybe I could ask the question, if Paul takes us back to the Old Testament to understand righteousness by faith, why should I limit my study to Paul? Why not go back and study those texts that Paul used? Does that make any sense? especially if I'm an Old Testament geek. I'm going to want to find, does, Paul doc, does Paul's doctrine actually occur there? And so when this thought came to me a number of years ago, I've been working on justification by faith according to the Old Testament scriptures. And so what I'd like to share with you the rest of today and the next two days is the message of justification by faith as witnessed by the law and the prophets. Okay, is that good? And we'll have occasion to show how Paul says the same thing and Jesus himself alludes back to the Old Testament as well. And so the evidence is there. But um, I am convicted the Old Testament is in continuity with the New. The Old Testament is continually referred to by the New Testament writers as the basis for why they believe that Jesus is Christ because it was foretold in the Old Testament. So you ready for this little journey? Let's take a journey to the Old Testament and let's look for 
this message, which Ellen White says is the third angel's message in verity. Well, we first have to look at the key word, justify. Justification, the verb is justify. And here, right at the very beginning, we find where part of the problem has been, especially for our Catholic brothers and sisters. Because the word justify in Hebrew, tzadak, in its causative form, it never means to make righteous. It consistently means to declare righteous. It's a legal term that is used to describe the pronouncement of the judge that the one under trial is acquitted, that it, he is declared in the right. The same as with in the Old Testament, you find the Old Testament translated into Greek. So you've got the Greek word, dikaio, and that's the same word that's used in the New Testament. And once again, this word in Greek, the verb does not mean to make righteous. It means to declare righteous. It's a legal courtroom term to describe the pronouncement of the judge that one under trial is acquitted, declared in the right. That's the terminology. So we've got to start with that. When we see the word justify, we can't read make righteous because that's not the meaning of the word. It means to declare righteous. Now, is the person righteous that's declared righteous? Well, that's what we need to look and see. And here's where the problem comes, that in the Latin, now remember, Jerome, the great uh, church father, translated the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into Latin, Latin Vulgate. It was the lingua franca of the early ages, after the demise of uh, the Greek Empire, there came the Roman Empire, which spoke Latin, and so Latin became the word of the church. And all the Bibles that were used throughout the thousand years, almost 1,500 years up to the time of the Reformation, were Latin Bibles. The, the, the priests, the pastors, the people had no access most of the people didn't have access to any Bible, but the ones that did have access to them only read it out of Latin. Now, you know, if any of you who've worked from one language to another, that some words cannot be adequately translated into another language without some confusion. We could give examples of this. I give one example is... Uh, when I was in Hong Kong, I was a student missionary there as a, as a college student. And I spent a long time just learning my name. So I could, the first day of class, you know, I had coaches because, you know, Ch Chinese, Cantonese has five different tones. And it depends whether you're doing this or you're up here or you're down here or you're going down or up. So I, I thought I had it down perfectly. Nga hai dai wai sun sin san. I am Mr. Davidson. So I got up in front of my class the first day and I said that and everyone started laughing like crazy. I said, I said to the one in the front row that could actually speak some pretty good English, I said, what did I do wrong? And they said, well, you had the right sound but you had the wrong tone. You were saying, I am Mr. Pregnant, son. <laughs> so even the right... Uh, Tone, even the right sound without the right tone can get you into trouble. And in this case, the Latin got the whole early church into trouble because Jerome translated these Greek and Hebrew terms which, which mean declare right, and he translated it by justificare, which in its etymology drawn from the Roman culture meant to make just. And so Jerome started taking all these texts of Paul and all these texts which mean declare just, and he translated them and interpreted them mean to make righteous. So the whole church began to understand that justification was God making us righteous. And once we're righteous, then we can stand before him and then he can accept us based upon our righteousness. 
Salvation by works. And they could prove it from their Latin Bible. Martin Luther did not understand justification until he taught himself Greek and Hebrew. And then he went to the Latin and he said, Latin is not so good because it distorts the basic meaning of what justification is. My wife uh, teaches systematic theology uh, and she's, she's a closet the Old Testament theologian. So every time she has a chance to, to promote the Old Testament, she does. So she has on her door this quotation from Martin Luther and from John Calvin saying, without the biblical languages, we would never have recovered the gospel. And that doesn't mean everyone has to learn the languages, but it means that if you're studying something this important in Latin and you find that that's not the right meaning, you better check what is the meaning behind that word. That's why I hope when you study the Bible, if you don't learn Greek and Hebrew, uh, Hebrew, of course, is the heavenly language, and I would strongly urge you to try that. But if you choose not to, you'll learn it in heaven soon enough. But at least read a variety of translations because the translators are trying very hard to get at the right meaning, and sometimes a Hebrew word can mean four or five different things. It's so rich. And so often if you have maybe ten translations in front of you, you'll see five of them that are different, and all five of them are right. They capture one nuance, another nuance of the, of the Hebrew. So a little plug for languages, even though language is really hard for me. I have to confess, it's my tool. It's like my hammer for a carpenter. But I'm not a natural linguist. So I go on vacation, and I, still, I take on vacation my Hebrew vocabulary to try to keep reminding myself and remembering. It's uh, you know, something you keep on doing. Anyway, so justification by faith. So now let's go to the Bible texts. And the best place to start any subject is Genesis 1 to 3. Paul, in Romans 5, when he introduced justification by faith, throughout Romans 5, he goes back to Genesis 1 to 3, Adam and Christ. And he finds his basic teaching on justification by faith from the beginning. I have become convinced that every major doctrine and teaching of the Bible has its roots in Genesis 1 to 3. This is the fountainhead. This is the introduction to the whole Bible, and the rest of the Bible elaborates upon those early chapters of Genesis. So, if you have your Bibles, open to Genesis 1, and let's look at Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27 for our first text. This is the sixth day of creation. Then God said, let us make... Now, instead of translating the word, I'm going to put the Hebrew word in. Let us make Adam in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the sea, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created Adam in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Adam, from which we get our word Adam, here does not mean Adam. It means humankind. It's the general word for mankind. We don't, that's, that's not uh, gender correct anymore, so we don't say mankind. We say humankind to be gender uh, neutral. Uh, but it means, it means humankind. God created humankind. Then when you move to Genesis 2, we read in verses 18 to 23 that God calls this individual, this male individual that was created first, Ha-Adam. It could be translated the man, or it could be translated the human. But you don't usually put the article in front of a word if you're going to be using it as a proper name. So God's just calling him the human. Here's the human, Ha-Adam an individual person, 
the man. And then in the latter part of chapter 2 and 3, sometimes you have um, with the article the term the man, or sometimes you have also with the article, but it's clearly talking about Adam as a person. So as you read through these chapters, you find that this word is a word that is flexible. It talks about an individual, Adam, but it also talks about humanity in large. Adam actually comes from the term for ground. Adama means the ground. So Adam is the one that came from the ground as God shaped him and formed him and breathed into him his nostrils the breath of life. And then when you come to Genesis 5, notice what else it's, what it does here. Genesis 5, the summary. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. Adam, the person. In the day that God created Adam, humanity, he made him in the likeness of God. He made them male and female and blessed them and called them Adam, human, or humanity in the day that they were created. In that case, both the woman and the man are given the name Adam, Mr. and Mrs. Adam. Now, I, as close as I could come to this was when I married into Joanne's family, my wife's family, um, her last name is Mazat, but all of her relatives have a last name by, that is human. Mr. and Mrs. Human. Seven brothers that went to Union College and they all had the last name Human. And so, you know, they, they're used, they, they had these big reunions and they would say, they'd call you and say, are you coming to the Human Reunion next month? And I was thinking, well, are all the humans in the world going to be there or just the humans that are the human family? You had to make it very clear which human you were talking about. Sometimes it was just one family, sometimes it was the whole earth. And I didn't think anyone ever, they didn't ever invite the whole earth to come to their reunions. So what can we learn from this? We can learn that Adam, the person, stood for and was the representative head of the entire human race. How many Adams do we have in the Old Testament? How many people were named Adam besides this one? Can you think of any? I hope you can't because there aren't any. He's the only one. He's the only one that got the name Adam. He's the only Adam. The next Adam is Jesus, the second Adam. And I think it's purposeful. This is not to say anything negative about someone who's named their children Adam. It's, it's okay. But in the, in the beginning, there's this symbolic meaning. The name Adam stood for all humanity. All humanity was wrapped up in him. They were in corporate solidarity with him. So what's the implication of that? The implication is that Paul caught in Romans 5 when Adam sinned, the whole world sinned in him. And we all, as Romans 5, 19 is best translated, we were all constituted sinners in Adam. And that is a profound truth that the Bible starts out with. Adam, the person, includes or is representative of all of us. And so when Adam the person falls, we all become a sinful race. And that means when we're born, we're constituted guilty in Adam. Now, you, it's only if you understand that relationship between Adam and Adam, between the human person this first human person and the rest of the world that you can get justification by faith. Because then we move to the good news about this. What happened in Adam? Ellen White describes it this way. She said that his nature was curved and bent toward selfishness. 
so that he had now not a sinless nature, but he had a sinful nature, so that he was born leaning into sin. And there needed to be a way out, or this race of sinners would never have any hope. And I'm thankful that the gospel promise, first, the first gospel promise of Genesis 3.15 shows us the way out. Let's try to visualize what's described in Genesis 3.15. First of all, we have to put it in the context. This whole chapter of Genesis 3 is in a beautiful chiastic structure describing the fall of humans and God's promise of eternal life. And in these mountain climbing structures, like I like to call them, the central verse is often the most important verse. So the first half describes Eve being deceived and then her persuading Adam to follow suit and both of them taking on a, hum a, a sinful nature, a bent towards selfishness. But then God comes walking in the cool of the day and he starts asking questions. This is really the first investigative judgment in the Bible. God comes and starts asking Adam and Eve questions. First of all, he says, where are you? And Adam was hiding. He was afraid. And he says, I was afraid because I was naked. I hid myself. And then he said, who told you that you were naked? And have you eaten of the free, of the tree that I commanded you not to? And then the woman, and then he said, starts blaming, shows that his nature is curved. He starts blaming the woman. The woman you gave to be with me. So not only the woman, but the woman you gave. So he's blaming God also. And the woman said, it was a serpent. He's the problem. Do you see what's happened to their natures? They're curved in selfishness with a bent towards sin. They have become constituted sinners. And then God turns to this couple who are obviously realizing their great mistake and needing hope. And he says, first he says to the serpent, you are, you know, gives the judgment upon the serpent. But then in verse 15, you have the middle verse of the entire chapter. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, serpent, and between your seed, serpent, and her seed, Eve. So it starts with Eve and the serpent, Satan. Then he says there will be enmity, there will be this conflict between the descendants of Eve, spiritual descendants of Eve, and the spiritual descendants of Satan. There are this great conflict between good and evil. But then comes the promise. There was already an implied promise when he said he's going to put a conflict between us and Satan because after Adam and Eve sinned, they were naturally curved toward evil. The conflict, the enmity that God puts is already the first gift of grace that he is promised to make us hate sin again make us hate evil and hate the way of evil. But then comes the part of the promise that teaches us about justification by faith because it goes from the one down to the many and then it shifts back to the one, to the one who is the representative of the whole human race, the second Adam. And it says, he, he, the messianic seed, will bruise your head, O Satan, and you shall bruise his heel. Have you really pictured what this is describing? Forgive me for doing this in public, but I have to do it. This is what was described. It's God saying the messianic seed is going to take off his sandal and is going to step voluntarily barefoot on the head of a poisonous snake.
What does that imply? He's ready to die. He gives himself up to die so that he can take what we deserve. He can take the poison that we deserve so that he can give us the antidote that he deserved. We call that the substitutionary atonement. We call that the representative of, the, of, of, our, universe, of our humanity becomes human and he becomes the second Adam. And he goes through what the first Adam went through. But instead of falling like the first Adam, he succeeds. He's willing to step on that poisonous snake. Now, my first pastorate was in Arizona. And we, we had camp meeting in, in uh, Camp Yava Pines. Up, you remember where Camp Yava Pines is? I have one fellow... Uh, Sojourner, my pastorate uh, in that was from Arizona days. We shared being kings of the north, right? <laughs> anyway, but yet yeah, Camp Yava Pines was, was uh, in Prescott, Arizona. It was filled with rattlesnakes, downward back rattlesnakes. I am deathly afraid of snakes. But I come at it honestly because not only will I get in trouble if the snake bites me, but the antivenom that's used to save you kills me faster than the venom. It's the horse serum that the antivenom is made in. I had a horse serum shot in fifth grade, and I was just that close to dying. And they said, don't you ever let any horse serum get in your body again, or you'll be a dead man. So I don't fool around with snakes. I don't care whether they're poisonous or not. I live in Michigan across the across the lake and they say there are no poisonous snakes in southern Michigan. They say there are in northern Indiana, but they say that they stop at the border between Indiana and Michigan and they read the sign and they don't come north. And I don't believe that. <laughs> so every time I start my garden, I'm hoeing in the garden and I see, I hear, and I, or I experience a snake. It's always one of these harmless ones but there's a blood-curdling cry that comes out of my lungs. My wife and children used to come to try to rescue me until now they realize it's just a harmless snake. And Dad is just weird. And so no one comes to help me anymore. If there would be a real rattlesnake, I would have no hope. But one time in, color, in, in Arizona, between the time when we were as, uh, working for the camp staff I was the camp, uh, the camp uh, wrangler. I taught horseback riding, even though before that week I had never ridden a horse in my life. I had to go to the library to figure out which side to get on the horse. That's, that's pretty desperate times, but you know, when they assign you as a young pastor, you do what they tell you to do. And so I, fortunately, I had one young lady that was a camp, um, one of the camp uh, counselors that had her own horses. So I was the figurehead that would tell them what to do, but she'd be whispering behind my ear, now tell them to do this, now make sure. That... And so then I would, you know, pretend. But by the end of the week, I got really into being hor uh, horseback. My, re my horse was named Shadrach. And Shadrach and I would ride all day. And when we'd come in, t come and we'd be near a rattlesnake, Shadrach would carefully take us around the rattlesnakes and no problems. But between camps, I love to hike, and so I asked the camp ranger, is there a place around here where I can really get remote so I can clear my mind from all the young people that uh, wear you down after a week or two? And so he said, yeah, there's this place. No one ever goes there. It is so remote. It is so beautiful. And he gave me the directions to get there. He didn't bother to tell me the name of the place was Rattlesnake Basin. <laughs> and it is the place where all the rattlesnakes in the world, I think, find this place, and there are hundreds of them in there. It's the breeding ground for all of Arizona. Did you know that rattlesnakes went on migrations? Another story I'll, I won't tell now, but uh, in Wyoming, this range, uh, Wyoming guy told me that uh, he lives on the path of the rattlesnake migration route, and so every spring he goes out, and on his front porch he's got 25 or 30 rattlesnakes just sitting sunning on his front porch. Well, I wasn't there, but I was in Rattlesnake Basin. 
So I was walking along, came up over the basin, and here was a log, and I decided, I usually just step over the log. It's a lot less energy. I, somehow, I know the Lord was telling me, step on the log. I stepped on the log, and then when I looked down, but I couldn't stop myself, there was a, rattles, a, a diamondback rattlesnake just curled, ready to grab me. And I put my foot there, and somehow the Lord gave me the muscles of Michael Jordan, and I could jump 30 feet in the air, it felt like, and I landed in a heap on the other side, and I was a basket case. I wasn't ready to take off my sandal or my shoe or my boot and step on the snake, but Jesus did, knowing full well it would kill him. He took the venom that we deserved. We see it here in Genesis 3, a beautiful picture of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus. The implication is that the guilt of Adam and Eve and their sin will be imputed to the representative seed, the Messiah, and he will bear our penalty behalf. I love this quotation that Ellen White gave in a, a letter back in 1900. The instant man accepted the temptation of Satan and did the very things God said he should not do, Christ, the Son of God, stood between the living and the dead, saying, let the punishment fall on me. I will stand in man's place. That, my friends, is what justification is all about reaching out and accepting the gift of Jesus who has stood in our place and taken what we deserved and given us his righteousness that he deserved. And that second part of the story is also in Genesis 3. Just a few verses later, in Genesis 3.21, we read about the first sacrifice. Then the Lord said to Adam and Eve, uh, I'm sorry, verse 20. And for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Now, they needed the clothes for the physical covering, the constant, beautiful temperature, temperate climate was changed as a result of the fall. But that's not only what this is talking about. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, were naked, right? Is that right? They knew that they were naked. And so they grabbed fig leaves to cover themselves, right? And so now, were they naked anymore? Because they had the fig leaves on. Logically, we would say, no, they're covered. But when God comes walking in the cool of the day, where are you, Adam? Adam says, I'm hiding from you, God, because I'm naked. What? He's got on the fig leaves. Do you realize that nakedness is more than physical nudity here? Nakedness, Ellen White says this, nakedness, the nakedness of Adam was his nakedness of soul. He felt this terrible guilt and shame that he couldn't cover with any works of his own, any fig leaves of his own. And so if his nakedness is more than physical nudity, but includes nakedness of soul, then when God clothes Adam and Eve with skins of sin, he's doing more than covering up their bodies. He is dealing with the nakedness of their soul with their guilt, with their shame, that they can't take care of them on their own by any kind of fig leaves, any kind of works of their own. And so the sacrifice, that sacrifice is killed. I think it was, God, uh, it was not God that killed the sacrifice. If we go to Leviticus 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, you find that the sinner was the one who had to take the knife and to kill the animal. God said, here's the knife, Adam. You need to understand how serious sin is. And Adam watched as he slit the throat of the lamb. He watched that innocent animal slumping into his arms. He had already wept just to see the leaves drooping. But now here is this beautiful animal that's dead because of his sin. 
And God, who didn't want to see the death of anything either, but had desperately tried to show him how he could find a Savior, uses this illustration and incorporates and installs the sacrificial system so that we can learn how terrible sin is and that we are all sinners by action, by motive, by nature. In Adam, all died. But in Christ, because of the gospel, we all can have eternal life, not based on the fig leaves, but based on that robe of righteousness that God put around Adam and Eve. And so we reach out and in take, we take that gift. So how can I summarize here? Here's a summary of what we've learned already in these early chapters. Number one, justification is a judicial declaration of acquittal. God says, through the sacrifice, you will be acquitted, not condemned. Justification is based upon the external righteousness of Christ, covering us with His robe, with what represents His righteous works, not our inherent fig leaves, our attempt to cover ourselves or work our way to heaven. And three, the sole ground of justification is the substitutionary death of Christ and the imputed merits which He imputes to us, He accounts to us, not the imparted righteousness of Christ, the sanctification. Both are important, but the one that gives us the ground of salvation is not what we do, but what He does for us. And fourthly, we reach out with those empty hands of faith to take, like Adam and Eve did, that free gift, not with works, but that free gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. I pray that this experience may be ours every day. We will continue going through the Old Testament tomorrow at this time. Let's have a prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for the picture of Jesus here in these opening chapters. He's the second Adam. In the first Adam, we find only guilt and shame. But in the second Adam, we find the free gift of him who died for us and who lived for us and wants to impute that to our account so that you can look down and not see us, but see Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for making us acceptable before you through the mighty gift of Calvary. In Jesus' name, amen.